a great pleasure to be able to uh, to do this uh, talk for you guys. I um, you know I think one of the things that's lost when we had the in person um, is that uh, uh, it wasn't as interactive. But I'm going to try to make it as much interactive as as I can. So I actually have a list of all the residents' name here, and so please. Uh, put on your video screen because you will be asked questions uh, throughout the talk. Um, all right, so let's get started. We're going to be talking about revision, total knee arthroplasty. It's going to be fairly practical, but some high, higher level sort of theory as well. So we know this is a big problem. Uh, any talk on arthroplasty wouldn't be complete without a, a nod to some of Steve Kurtz's work. Um, they estimate by the year 2030, which is fast approaching, that the number of uh, TK revisions is expected to increase 600%. And if you look at the, uh, the graphs on the, on the right, uh, a lot of that expansion in the uh, knee burden is, is based on the uh, increases in the primary uh, total knees that are performed. Uh, this is a costly procedure, upwards of $50,000. And the indication for revisions around the knee, uh, in contrast to hips, where the most common etiology of failure is going to be instability, for knees is uh, infection, uh, accounting for at least a quarter of those uh, um, cases. And we think that's due in part to the, the uh, soft tissue envelope around the knee. But obviously, mechanical loosening, implant failure all account for a, a portion of that. So these are my keys to a successful revision uh, total knee replacement. Number one, don't fix it if you don't know why it's broke. So in contrast to hips, um, for a knee, there could be a, a painful total joint uh, with a, a perfect exam and good looking x-rays. And we know that uh, upwards of 20% of patients after total knees are not completely satisfied with their outcome. And just because they're having pain and some dissatisfaction is not an indication uh, to do a revision. Number two, you want to definitely rule out infection. And my number three is also rule out infection. So you don't ever want to be caught um, with a, a cold infection thinking that it's aseptic because they could be uh, concomitant uh, as infection can result in, in loosening of the implant. I think Derek is either going to or has given a talk on PJI. So I'm going to have a few slides on that, but not delve into it too deeply. Now, when we get to surgery, you want to obtain an adequate exposure, and I'm going to go over uh, tips on, on doing so. Uh, you want to minimize your iatrogenic bone loss uh, because you can't give that back to the patient. Uh, you're going to have to uh, replace that with uh, metal. Uh, then you want to reestablish your symmetry of your flexion and extension gaps, as well as uh, restoring uh, the joint line uh, to ensure proper kinematics uh, of the knee and a, a functional uh, arthroplasty. And then you want to restore your proper coronal, sagittal, and rotational uh, alignment uh, of your components. And you want to use the minimum amount of constraint necessary. And we'll go over levels of constraint. But the more constraint you put into your total knee construct, the more forces are then, um, uh, then passed along to either the uh, implant cement or cement bone interface, which could result in loosening. And then finally, you want to maximize the inherent stability of your construct across this bone cement implant interface with things such as augments, uh, cones, uh, and stems. So now the year is 2030, uh, and some of these budding arthroplasty surgeons are going to be into their practice, um, and we'll go over a number of cases. So the first case is Mr. Thomas, a 58-year-old uh, male who underwent a left total knee in 03 with a, a one-year history of progressive left knee pain with ambulation, uh, healthy on exam. It's got a good range of motion, a mild effusion, uh, well-healed uh, incision, and it's got good uh, ligamentous stability. So for our, um, our recent twos, uh, why don't we have Jen O'Donnell read these uh, x-rays? Yes, thanks, Dr. Um, oh, God. Um, so, sorry, good, Marcus. Um, thanks. Sorry, I was echoing. Um, so, we have here a um, cemented PS knee um, in AP lateral and patellar views um, on the AP and lateral as far as um, size. Um, 
I think that on the lateral, the femoral component looks like it's possibly a little large looking at Shenton's line posteriorly. Um, and the tibial component, I think as far as size um, looks appropriate. Then the positioning of it um, looks um, appropriately positioned. I think that the tibial component on the lateral um, seems to have, if anything, a maybe anterior slope. So neutral, neutral or anterior. Um, and then uh, fixation wise, um, I don't see any lucency in the tibial component. Um, cement uh, looks intact. Uh, there's some osteolysis um, around the tibial component actually. Um, and then the femoral component, I think there is some lucency on the anterior. Um, yeah. And what about the patellofemoral compartment? You're on mute, Jen. Sorry, what was that? What about the patella? Um, yes, so I think the patella looks um, a little bit subluxed here uh, laterally um, in the patella femoral view. Um, as far as its positioning in the lateral, um, it looks looks maybe a little bit high, but um, a, moderately so. So good. So I would say this is three views of a left knee. The patient has a cemented posterior stabilized total knee. So we talk about fixation and level of constraint for our knees. So this box indicates it's a posterior stabilized knee. And you can see the cement under the keel indicating it's fixation is cement. So then we talk about size, position, fixation. Obviously, we're looking uh, at both components. So if the tibia, you want it to fit on the tibial plateau, looks, looks reasonable. Size of a femur is done A to P. And as uh, Jen mentioned, you wanna look at Shenton's line. Uh, unclear whether or not this is large for the patient and it's uh, kind of breaking Shenton's line. But if you look at the AP and you see the medial lateral kind of width of each, it looks like they're about right. So I think, uh, again, the size is probably okay. There might be some other reasons causing the break in Shenton's line. For position, we like a kind of mechanical aligned tibia uh, for most of us, so perpendicular to the shaft. Slope on a PS knee is going to be neutral. I think this is about neutral. I don't think it's reverse slope. For the femur, we want it flush with the anterior cortex. We don't want it flexed or extended. Uh, we don't want it varus or valgus in the coronal plane. And then fixation, I think you mixed a few terms. You've called osteolysis under the tibia. So you, you can't call osteolysis on an x-ray. You can call radiolucencies. And you can say the radiolucencies are consistent with osteolysis based on the clinical history. But you see a radiolucency under the tibial base plate, I agree. And you see one under the anterior femoral flange. Uh, and then for the patella, maybe a little bit asymmetrically resurfaced. I don't think it's tilting, but there looks to be a little bit of heterotopic bone on the lateral facet. So taking that all together, Jen, what would be your next workup? So it's over 15 years, total knee working well, one year of pain. Uh, effusion and these x-rays? Um, yeah, as we mentioned for revision, I would always begin with getting ESR, CRP, and then if those are elevated in aspiration. Okay, so negative workup. Anything else you'd do? Um, I think I'd also test for um, just overall, um, you know, any other medical problems that they have, any like rheumatologic issues, um, so what do you think happens when a, a knee's been in there for you know, 17 years? What's, what's the natural process of, of, of the, the bearing surface? Um, so we'd be worried about polyethylene wear um, with a knee that's been in for that long. Yeah, and you saw the radiolucencies under the femoral flange. Does that give you any pause or, or uh, does that make sense to you? <laughs> yeah, that does make sense. Um, so osteolysis is kind of mediated by polyethylene wear. And what does that ultimately potentially result in? Um, aseptic loosening, uh, yeah, or a, uh, either way, loosening. Aseptic loosening meaning it's not infected. So would you do any further workup? And if, if so, what could you get? Um, for the loosening, you can get a bone scan. Um, so you can consider that. 
So you get a bone scan and it looks like this. Does that uh, corroborate with what you're, you're leaning towards? Um, yeah, so there's some increased uptake around the implant, um, which in what I was leaning towards based on the, what we've discussed so far is that this is an uh, implant that's loosening. Um, so this does corroborate that. Good. All right, we'll move on to the next uh, case. Mrs. Brown, 50-year-old status post bilateral. Can I ask a quick question, Dr. Hansen? Yeah, go for it. I, I kind of struggle to understand exactly how a bone scan helps you in this situation because say it's negative, but I mean, you know, maybe you have a, a an x-ray from a few years prior where you don't see that those lucencies and now you do. Um, I mean, it seems like the diagnosis is, is fairly obvious and if they're having pain and discomfort, they need a revision. I just don't quite understand how the bone scan helps. It's a great part, Char Charlie. I, I personally wouldn't have gotten a bone scan. I think the x-rays in the story are compelling enough to uh, indicate the patient for revision surgery. Uh, this is just to be complete, but I agree with you completely. You don't need a bone scan in all, all situations. Maybe in a cementless total knee, uh, a bone scan would be more helpful, um, but, but not in this case. Isn't, okay. isn't the sensitivity of a bone scan like 99 to 100% for loosening? I don't know if it's, I, I wouldn't say it's that high because uh, I get very equivocal scans and I, I base a lot on my clinical judgment and the chronology of the symptoms, et cetera. Okay. Um, even a negative scan. So a negative scan doesn't tell me that it's not loose if, if the story is compelling enough. So this is another patient, uh, bilateral total. Just one, one, sorry, one more thing, Dr. Hatt. I mean, yeah. <laughs> could you use it to, you know, you say like the tibia is completely cold on there, but the femur is lighting up. I mean, would that potentially change your plan? Like you're, you know, you'd be ready to revise the tibia if needed, but you'd be more thinking just the femur or uh, vice versa, you know. Essentially, that... I'd say there are, there are the rare cases where you do a single component revision, but uh, usually uh, we do both components, um, but that potentially would help you uh, in terms of um, you know, making a final call about uh, one versus a two component revision. Um, and so this is the next patient. This is Brown, 50 year old status post to bilateral total knees at six weeks. The right knee is doing great. Left knee clicks and feels somewhat angulated uh, on exam. Good range of motion, no effusion. Uh, the right is uh, stable. The left has some coronal laxity. So uh, let's uh, call um, uh, Fabian. Vivian, you on the line? What are you thinking uh, when a patient comes at six weeks, when, when he's doing great, when he feels angulated clinically and uh, has some coronal laxity? So it could be multiple factors. It could be that the, uh, the gaps weren't properly balanced. It could be that the, um, there could be uh, some iatrogenic injury to the lateral ligaments. Um, uh, looking at the positioning of the components for the left, it is a cemented PS knee. On, um, I would say it, it look, they look appropriately positioned and fixed. Um, yeah, so, so good. I mean, um, I think that that's, that's right on. So you're thinking about, was the knee not well balanced? Was there an injury at the time of surgery or early post-operatively? And then you also have to think about the, the bony cuts and that, how that can affect the alignment. So on these short films, uh, things look pretty good, right? Would you agree, Fabian? I mean, on the right, it looks like it was, looks like it was cut in a bit of varus, but uh, it, the patient's doing well on that knee. Yeah, so this is great. So. Infectious workups negative. We get alignment films, and this is the alignment. So you see on the right knee, even though on the short film, the tibia is in a bit of varus, uh, the mechanical axis is falling through the central third. And on the left knee, where the short film looked like it was perpendicular to the tibia, the patient's in quite a bit of uncorrected valgus. So that's the importance of, of doing a clinical exam and also scanograms uh, in cases where you think that there might be some malalignment because the short film won't highlight that. All right, we're moving on to the next case. Mr. Smith, 65-year-old guy, right total knee, 2009, one-year history of right knee pain with uh, ambulation and effusions. He did have a notable history of septic arthritis, which was washed out five years prior to his index TKA. Uh, he's got good range of motion, one, one plus effusion, well-healed incision, no erythema or warmth. Uh, so uh, Sarah, are you on the call? Yes. 
Can you read these films for us? Sure. So this is three views of a primary cemented PS knee. Um, the femoral component appears appropriately sized, positioned, and fixed. The tibial component appears to be in, or the joint line, I should say, appears to be in slight valgus. Um, and it, it appears well fixed at the keel, but uh, it is also possible that it has subsided into that valgus, just looking at the sort of remnant of the lateral uh, condyle. Um, and then the patella appears to be in the appropriate position. Yeah, so good. Cemented, posterior, stabilized, total knee. I think size, position, fixation, position look okay. I'd say the fixation on the tibia, you can see uh, radial lucency under the base plate here. This is mm -hmm. my arrow showing up on your screen? Yes. Okay, so you can see this radial lucency here, and you can almost see a cement bone radial lucency on the AP. It looks like the joint was cut a little bit low. You see where the tibial resection is to the fibular head. Um, but in, in any event, uh, with this history, uh, what, what's your workup? Yeah, so definitely going to evaluate for infection. He's, I guess, are we counting that it's 2021? So he's like 12 years out now? Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so yeah. What's yeah. infectious workup? ESR, CRP, um, CVC. You can also, obviously, if those are elevated, you'd consider an aspiration, can get things like alpha defensin, okay. um, synovial leukocyte count. So these numbers on... on the uh, ser serologies concerning to you? Uh, they are elevated for a late, um, yeah, in the late stage, yeah. So you go forward and you aspirate the knee and this is what you get. Gram stain negative, 3,000 whites, 85% polys. Concerning, not concerning? Concerning. Yeah. So we can go over the, the thresholds uh later but uh concerning for an infection all right and then uh i think the last case uh before we get on to the lecture is mr white 52 year old underwent a left total knee in 11 secondary patella resurfacing in 13 recurrent swelling giving way and clunking uh notable past medical history of airlers danlos good range of motion a 10 degree lag some subluxation of the patella uh and some laxity in in mid flexion anthony wiggins you on the line No. Hunter Warwick on the line. So we have uh, three views of a left uh, cemented, um, what I believe is a posterior stabilized knee. Um, the femoral component appears appropriately sized, uh, positioned, and fixed. Uh, the tibial components, it looks like is kind of like maybe you you know, sitting in a bit of valgus. So we have a little bit of uh, radial lucency where it's not flush with the tibial surface um, laterally. Um, and then, you know, on the patellar view, you have um, pretty, you know, you have patellar tilt and uh, uh, lateral subluxation of the patella. So yes, cemented posterior stabilized total knee. We talk about the femur size. So if you look at the lateral, I would say that it looks a little undersized. And then when you corroborate with the AP, look at the femoral width compared to the tibial width. That gives you another sense that maybe the femur is undersized. You see that? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that can contribute to some mid-flexion instability, right? And then in, you said the tibia is in valgus. Actually, the tibia, if anything, is in a little bit of varus, right? So if the lateral plate is off the bone, it's tipped into varus. Um, but I think what's also important to note is uh, although, you know, you can't uh, really judge tibial rotation on an x-ray, the fibula is behind the tibia, so maybe this is a true AP, and if you look at the keel, there's asymmetry of that keel, suggesting that there's a rotational uh, problem with the tibial component, and if you have an internal rotation of the tibial component, that can affect this lateral subluxation of the patella. You see that? So, good. So any further workup or indication to do surgery? Uh, you know, in this case, I think you have your symptoms aligned with what you see on x-ray. Um, I think, you know, it'd, it'd be reasonable to get, in, get, get some labs just to confirm that there's not infection, but I think otherwise, you know, you're probably looking at a vacant surgery. Yeah, so we're going to say these are all non-infected, but some people would get a CT scan, and, and that's to assess the rotation of both the femoral and the tibial components. So they draw the transepicondylar axis and the posterior condylar axis to look for internal rotation. 
I would say that's unnecessary. Just to Charlie's point earlier, if you already have evidence on an x-ray of patellar uh, instability, then you don't need a CT scan. CT scan might be more helpful for um, uh, diagnosing subtle rotational abnormalities that are not uh, evident on a static patellofemoral film and uh, a good history of what you think is patellar instability. Um, and then to Andrew's point, well, would the CT scan help you decide whether you're going to just revise one of the malposition components? I would say that intraoperatively is gonna be your best assessment. So a CT scan to help you make a one versus two component revision would be not necessary. Again, I didn't get this study. Dr. Hansen, uh, really quick, would you get full length films in that case too? Um, I usually get full length films, but uh, um, I don't think that that's a bad idea. Uh, uh, so if you left someone in uncorrected valgus, that could lead to patellar maltracking too. So I have one last case, Mrs. Taylor, 68 year old people. Do you how do you determine rotation of your tibia the same way? I feel like it'd be harder with your tibial component on the CT scan compared with- so You look at the tibial tubercle and then you can look at uh, uh, the keel. The keel, okay. Yep. So this is Mrs. Taylor, 68 year old woman, two years after a right total knee complaint. Her right knee continues to hurt like it did before. She's here for a second opinion, tried ice, non-operative uh, measures, uh, uh, stable exam and these films. So uh, Aviona, are you on the call? Okay. I think she's post call today. Okay. Churches on the call. Yep, I'm here. All right. All right. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Um, so here we have AP and lateral views of a uh, cemented PS knee on the right side. Uh, looking at the femoral component. Uh, it looks well positioned and well fixed. Um, and then moving on to the tibial Precise component. position and fixation, yeah. SPF, like suntan lotion. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of sizing, uh, it looks appropriately sized. Um, it looks well located and well fixed. I don't see any radial lucency. Uh, and then looking at the tibial component, um, it looks well sized. Um, in terms of the fixation, uh, the tibial plateau looks uh, well fixed. And then looking at the keel, it looks like there might be a gap in the cement mantle um, distally, but otherwise it appears well fixed. So that's just a plastic bullet on the end of a, a keel. That's to allow a, a stem to, to, to be placed if you wanted to. So I would say relatively well-sized position fixed. Maybe the tibia is in a, in a touch of varus, but, but not bad. So um, with this history, uh, what further workup would you consider. Yeah, so as always, we want to make sure that it's not infected, uh, not infected. Assuming, it's, assuming it's not infected. Um, did she have any uh, laxity on physical exam? No, stable knee. Okay. Perfect, perfect exam, perfect x-rays. Um, would this be a case in which we'd want to get a CT scan to evaluate for subtle rotation? So remember, her knee continues to hurt like it did preoperatively. What does that let you know? or suggest? Um, oh, uh, you would need to uh, evaluate the hip to make sure that there's not any referred pain coming from the hip. Good, so there's two things you can do. Uh, and I would say that's imaging, right? So first imaging is, what did her preoperative x-rays look like? Uh, if you have access to those, those could be very uh, informative. So these were her preoperative x-rays. So someone did a total knee for knee pain with these x-rays and expected that the pain was gonna get better. So not, not great. But as you mentioned, always think about the hip as a proximal source of referred pain. And these are her hip x-rays. So you always have to think about, you know, the back for the hip and the hip for the knee. All right, so in terms of primary symptoms, uh, you wanna um, sort of elicit whether it's pain, stiffness, instability, or a combination of stiffness and instability. That's why they're coming to the office. Uh, then note the onset of uh, onset uh, uh, aggravating and alleviating factors. If it's no difference from pre-op, again, extra articular sources have to be high on your differential. If it began shortly after surgery, we think about infection, component malposition, or soft tissue problems, and late onset infection, loosening, or wear-related instability. And it's always important to ask patients if they uh, specifically had any um, perioperative complications, if they might not uh, volunteer uh, provide the information. So 
whether they had use of prolonged antibiotics, they needed an actual washout, was there drainage from the incision? And on exam, you'll, you'll run the spectrum of people in varus or valgus alignment. You want to figure out if it's a correctable deformity or if it's fixed. You want to check their range of motion, determine whether they have a, a flexion contracture or an extensor lag. So I think I'm done with the two. So what, um, uh, Avi, are you on the line? He's on vacation this week. Okay. Tiffany, you on the line? She's post-call. Garcia, you on the line? Someone says post-call. That's too many campuses. Freshman. Freshman's here. Um, so Difference talking about, between uh, a flexion contractor and an extensor lag. Yeah, so um, an extensor lag means that the patient can't actively extend their leg to um, neutral extension, but once you can passively get it there, whereas a flexion contracture, you will not be able to passively get their leg to full extension. Good, and what does an extensor lag suggest? Um, an extensor lag can suggest incompetent um, an extensor mechanism um, or uh, basic difficulties with uh, the, the joint line could be altered um, and cause uh, problems with the biomechanics. And the, and the, yeah, uh, you just think about the, the biomechanics yeah. of the extensor mechanism. So anything along that mechanism from the quad to the tendon, quad tendon, to the patella, patella tendon, tibial tubercle, anything along that circuit can be uh, uh, pathologic and result in that extensor lag. So we check stability. Uh, we, we look at dynamic stability uh, when they ambulate, whether they've got a, a lateral thrust, we test them uh, uh, in the seated position at 0, 30, and 90, uh, both uh, uh, varus valgus and A to P. We look at prior scars, and then we do a vascular exam. So in terms of determining stability, uh, in terms of the sagittal stability, uh, we're, we're basically doing a, a drawer at uh, 30 and uh, 90 degrees. Uh, and if they have uh, a laxity uh, with uh, AP, uh, it's often a flexion extension mismatch with a flexion gap larger than the extension gap. It could also suggest PCL uh, incompetence in someone who previously had a cruciate retaining total knee. For varus valgus instability, it could be iatrogenic injury or uh, a, a, a late rupture of an MCL or the lateral structures, or it could be just a failure to have balanced the knee initially. And when you have both coronal and sagittal laxity, you think more about either an undersized liner at the time of surgery or bearing wear late. In terms of imaging, we looked at some alignment films. What you can get from that is both the distal femoral and the proximal tibial resection angle. On an AP, you can look for asymmetric wear of the liner. You can look for radiolucencies under the tibial base plate, overhang of the tibial component, and, and or subsidence of either uh, component. On a lateral, you're looking for that femoral component size, so trying to restore the Shenton's line of the um, uh, posterior condylar uh, offset. Uh, you also can look at the uh, patellar height if you're worried about the extensor mechanism. On the PF view, you're looking for tilt malalignment, uh, overall composite thickness. Is it under resected? Is it over resected? You can also uh, sometimes see femoral overhang. On the oblique views, which we don't often get, you can see early osteolytic lesions, uh, which uh, are going to be masked uh, on the AP of the femur. And then some people will get dynamic views uh, to test the MCL and LCL. And then on this image below, you're looking at a max flex um, uh, uh, lateral radiograph of a CR knee, which has paradoxical roll forward. So that suggests that you have PCL incompetence. And I think most importantly is looking at serial films. So for that patient with the femoral radiolucencies behind the anterior flange, if they didn't have those immediately postoperatively, that would be again, concerning for the, for the story that we were talking about. Uh, advanced imaging is rarely used, but uh, we talked about the CT to assess rotation of components. We talked about the bone scan, which can be, uh, you know, read uh, uh, as or look hot even up to a year in a normal knee. And then there are some indications for doing a tag white blood cell scan. Uh, for a ruling out infection, you get the serologies. Uh, you know that you have to be off antibiotics for at least two weeks to get a reliable result. The CRP will normalize in about three weeks, where the ESR will often be elevated up to three months post-op. In terms of numbers for joint aspirations, we got the acute infection here, so a white count on the order of 10,000 or greater. 
whereas in a chronic setting, it's going to be on the order of about 3,000. And then the poly percentage is going to be different, about 90% in the acute phase and 80% uh, in the chronic uh, phase. There are other serologic tests that are being studied, like interleukin-6 and D-dimer, and those are sort of the um, thresholds that are thought to be reliable for diagnosing infection. And there are other synovial tests that uh, some institutions use like the urine dipstick, which is a point of service test, uh, basically a proxy of the amount of white blood cells in the fluid. Uh, there's synovial CRP and then alpha defense, in which is um, one of the newer um, uh, diagnostic tests that a lot of us use because it's demonstrated the best accuracy of any of our uh, infection tests. So now we'll go to an oity type question. Um, and uh, how about Marcus? Are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. All right. So healthy 70-year-old man has a swollen knee after undergoing a knee replacement 10 years ago. Aspirate the knee, cloudy, viscous fluid. Lab studies show an ESR of 10 and CRP of 0 0.5. So what's the most likely diagnosis? Take us through your reasoning. Uh, cloudy, viscous fluid doesn't make me all that happy. Um, most likely diagnosis with an ESR of 10, but a CRP of less than 0.5. Uh, I mean, you could see cloudy viscous fluid if it was just like a polyware related synovitis. Um, I'd say the most likely diagnosis, I don't think three or four, and then this has been in for 10 years. Um, I mean, I, I would favor two, I guess, in this one. But yeah, so that's the right point. answer. Um, so if someone has rheumatoid arthritis or gout, their serologies are probably going to be higher than that. If they're infected, we talked about it. This would not be consistent with an infection. Uh, so you're right. I, I, 10 years out, you can imagine there's going to be somewhere uh, number two is going to be the, the best answer for this. So in terms of preoperative consults uh, before uh, taking someone for revision surgery, I rely on the first two uh, uh, to varying degrees. So complex history of infection, I'll get ID involved up front, uh, multiple prior incisions, a tenuous soft tissue envelope, prior gas rock flap, I'll have the plastic surgeon see them first because they'll probably help uh, during the closure. Uh, and then if they have non-palpable pulses potentially or uh, uh, a calcifications on a lateral x-ray in conjunction with non-palpable pulses, a referral to the vascular surgeons. So in terms of uh, a further pre-op planning, operative reports are not as important in total hip. Um, however, if you're going to do a one component revision, as, as Andrew was uh, alluding to, or an isolate, such as an isolated liner exchange, then you definitely need to know uh, not only the, the implant manufacturer uh, level of constraint, but also what your options are uh, and whether or not you can increase the level of constraint with the um, retained uh, components. So your operative day has arrived. So in terms of skin incisions, we're going to use the uh, most lateral incision uh, unless they've had uh, a recent uh, surgery through their more medial one. And the reason that is, is that we know that the blood supply to the uh, sort of uh, uh, anterior skin is going to come medially. So you want, to, you want to minimize trying to leave a skin bridge in between two incisions or it could get ischemic. Uh, they often will say you want to leave a, a six centimeter skin bridge, which is not usually feasible across a knee, uh, but you want to cross, um, uh, you know, horizontals perpendicularly, and you want to have sort of long, uh, large angles rather than acute angles if you are going to um, sort of stray from the prior incision. And then you've often heard me that I say no fat left on the fascia. And the reason that is, is that there's a very rich anastomotic um, system uh, in this in this area, and if you if you dissect too superficially, you can disrupt the, the blood supply there. In terms of our arthrotomy, uh, our workhorse is going to be the medial parapatellar, uh, which is shown here. And the goal uh, in a revision is going to be patellar subluxation, not aversion like it is in our primary uh, knees. Sometimes we need to do an extensile exposure because of the stiffness and the need to, to remove these well-fixed components. Uh, so proximally, you can do a quadriceps snip. This is a left knee. You can see how the um, tenotomy through the quad tendon is, is taken obliquely, superior laterally, uh, and that is, is fairly powerful. Uh, the, historically, there's been what's described as the VY turndown, but no one does it. So it's uh, only um, kind of in books, but not practical because it results in osteonecrosis 
of the patella as well as extensor mechanism uh, dysfunction. Distally, uh, we have the um, tibial tubercle osteotomy where you take a sort of medial to lateral cut uh, that uh, elevates the tibial tubercle with the whole extensor mechanism. Uh, this is a very powerful uh, exposure, uh, but there is some morbidity and some uh, technical challenges to doing it. Um, but if you have to remove, say, a revision type stem, this will allow you access to uh, debonding the cement uh, from the implant and the cement from the bone in a very safe manner. Uh, usually it can be fixed either with a, a screws or, or Lukey wires, whatever your, your, um, your pleasure. And when you do a tibial tubercle osteotomy, you don't have to change their post-operative rehabilitation. Um, and so that's an oity question often. Now, to remove the components with the uh, minimizing iatrogenic bone loss, uh, the idea is to do it in a staged or sequential fashion. So we remove the tibial insert first. Uh, many of you see me uh, kind of do things uh, special if they have high posts, like you can sometimes cut off the post and that allows it, if you can't dislocate the uh, tibia anteriorly, you can cut the post off. So you just have basically a CR insert. Um, and sometimes you'll have to remove that metal peg that reinforces the high post. But once you've removed the poly liner, then you're gonna focus on the femur, uh, then the tibia, and then depending on if you need to revise the patella, the patella. You don't wanna remove the patellar component too early in the procedure because you're often levering very hard on it and you don't wanna um, uh, fracture a deficient uh, patella. So the first thing you do is you identify your implant uh, interfaces. So removing all the synovium overhanging bone around the cement uh, implant or uh, bone implant interface. And then if it's cemented, your goal is to insinuate your device, whether it be a little saw or it be osteotomes between the cement and the implant, not between the cement and the bone. Your, your goal is to leave cement on the, on the bone and then take that off in a controlled fashion because the weaker link is often the mushy bone between the cement and the bone. Um, and so if you start working between the cement and the bone, you're gonna damage a lot of bone. And then you wanna use your, um, uh, your, your uh, impactors in a, a, in a sort of uh, straight midline way and not lever things or you could fracture uh, condyles. And uh, again, there are different devices. This is a jiggly saw that you can use a, a, around the anterior femoral flange. I tend to use a microsagittal saw and flexible osteotomes, but dealer's choice. Uh, and then the anatomy in a revision setting could be quite distorted, but what you'll reliably have is you'll have your epicondyles, and that will help you not only set your femoral rotation, but also establish the uh, appropriate height of your joint line. And again, even in a very deficient tibia, you'll still have your tibial tubercle, which will be important for how you set your rotation. In terms of, of kind of uh, figuring out where the joint line is, there's a number of different tricks. You can use the fibular head. It's about, it's usually about a finger's breadth above the fibular head. There's the meniscal scar often, you know, when we remove our menisci, we, uh, at least on the medial side, leave a little remnant. So that should um, help you uh, kind of find where the native joint line is. And then you can also use uh, the medial epicondyle, and it's usually about three centimeters distal to the medial epicondyle. When we're, um, when we're gonna be preparing the, the knee for our cutting blocks, we're, we're gonna uh, basically end osteal reference off the IM canal. So here's another weighty question. Um, we're on, Leah, are you on the call? I'm here. Great. So during primary total knee, uh, what is the maximum distance a joint line can be raised or lowered before poor motion, instability, and increased chance of revision occur? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I would guess. You can, you can take off. So as a, as a test taking, you know, strategy, yeah. which ones can you take off? I mean, I think both extremes, I think four millimeters would definitely be fine. And I think two millimeters sounds really big. Uh, even even 1.6 sounds uh, like a big increase to me. Uh, yeah, so I would say that's a good strategy. You can take off often the extremes uh, and 16 is, is a lot too, right? Yeah, so I'm, I would say um, eight, I guess. 
Yeah, so it's eight. And it depends on if you have a CR or PS knee. But a CR knee, you're not supposed to raise it more than three millimeters. And I think a PS is eight. But that doesn't mean that that you can it, things are great if you raise the joint line that far. Uh, if they've shown that uh, mid flexion instability can occur even if you raise it five millimeters. So that's why we're we're very mindful of of maintaining our, our distal femoral cut. So in terms of revising our bone cuts, we often start with the tibia because the tibia is the platform that we build our, our knee off of. It, as you recall, is gonna uh, symmetrically affect the flexion and extension gap. So you wanna create this stable platform to then build your femur off of. Um, so we ream until we get the intramedullary canal, so we're end osteo referencing. Then we put a zero degree cutting block on that. And we wanna make basically a fresh up cut on our bone surfaces. Uh, and it doesn't need to be a, it doesn't need to be a flat surface. If you have a, a varus collapsed tibia and the medial side is really deficient, but the lateral side is pretty good, you can do a step cut and then build up that bone defect with an augment. Um, and so you don't wanna necessarily cut all the way down and make a flat cut, or you're gonna be removing a lot of post bone and one of our tenants is to maintain bone um, as much as we can. On the femur, uh, you again, intramedullary reference, there's a distal femoral cutting block, um, again, set for about five to six degrees based on the manufacturer and you're gonna have unicondylar platforms. So you can again, cut a different surface on the medial and the lateral side, depending on how much bone loss is there. And you can build that back up with augments. And then when we rotate the, the femur, just like you see me do in a primary setting, we're doing that to the trans epicondylar axis because that's the origin of the medial and lateral collateral ligaments. Um, and for the patella, we frequently retain it unless there's something obvious about the patellar um, construct that's amiss uh, because you start to, start to, to really get into troubles with uh, a diminutive uh, patellar bone uh, and avascular uh, necrosis of the patella, potentially uh, extensor mechanism fracture. Um, and so if it's less than 12 millimeters, you uh, often will do just a, what's called a patelloplasty and just remove some osteophytes and allow scar tissue to form on the back surface of the host bone. So Dr. Hansen, sorry to interrupt. If, no, no, if, the, if this were for infection and you needed to remove all implants, yeah. you would remove the patella and then not recut as you're saying? Yeah, so you, in an infected setting, you got to get rid of all of the hardware, all of the retained cement. So you're going to remove everything. Um, and so again, you want to kind of go between the implant and cement, especially on the patella. So even if you left a, a, a thin layer of polyethylene, you could just go back with a burr and, and carefully just, just mow the lawn down on that. Um, but yes, you're going to remove all of the hardware. Next, you want to create symmetric uh, and equal flexion and extension gaps. So uh, for the junior residents, again, your flexion gap is determined by your tibial cut and your posterior cut and extension gap, tibial cut and distal cut. Um, and so we often will use spacer blocks to assess both the rectangular nature and if there's any mismatch of the two. Uh, often the flexion gap will be greater than the extension gap and some of the strategies we can do to, to close that flexion gap uh, asymmetrically is we can use a larger femoral component with posterior augments that will potentially bring the flexion gap down or we can use a posterior offset on our stem so that we can, if, the, if, the, if it's hanging up anteriorly, we can bring the whole femoral component down on the stem. Um, but those are two ways to, to deal with a flexion greater than extension gap. And then if someone had the patellar maltracking and you're worried about um, internal rotation of the femur. So this is a, a box of what would an internally rotated femur would be. So in this case, you would need a posterior lateral augment to externally rotate that femur back into uh, uh, a, a rectangle. So we use posterior and distal augments to, again, try to restore the gaps and the joint line. Um, and we, again, um, we'll use distal femoral augments to prevent uh, raising the joint line. So you can see here uh, a combined posterior and uh, distal femoral augment on this construct. 
Um, and this is a table that you all should be familiar with. I'm not going to go in, in, in detail through it, but it's something that uh, for OIDES, it's at least one, if not two questions. And the idea is that if it's a symmetric problem, you look at the tibia. So both are okay, no changes. Both are loose, you're going to have to build up the tibia. Both are tight, you're going to have to resect additional tibia. That's kind of the, 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 the easy way to think about uh, things. And the other important teaching point about uh, the joint line is your joint line is set by your distal femoral cut. It's not set by your tibia because in, in order for the, the, the polyethylene to touch the femur, you're gonna keep on building poly until those two meet each other. So your joint line is determined by your distal femur cut. It has nothing to do with your tibial cut. All right. Hogan, we done. Uh, so, Howa, are you on the line? Yeah, I am. All right. So, while, while performing a revision to total knee with the trial component in place, it is noted that the knee has full extension but is loose in flexion. To resolve this flexion extension uh, discrepancy, the surgeon should. Uh, so, we're looking at uh, um, someone who's uh, got flexion instability. Uh, so, I would uh, think that uh, you want to augment the posterior condyle. Um, and we had that one number two. Good. So what would using a thicker polyethylene insert address? I think it would address uh, uh, both types of instability, um, both of the extension and flexion. Good. How about a constrained polyethylene insert? That's going to help with uh, varus valgus. Good. Releasing the posterior capsule? Um, I think if you're um, also extension, I think if you're tight, uh, in the back, that's something that can help. Yeah, so removing posterior osteophytes and, re and releasing the posterior capsule helps the knee achieve more extension. So a tight extension gap, good. And cutting more posterior slope on the tibia? Yeah, so that's when you're worried that your uh, flexion gap is too tight. Uh, so if you cut more posterior slope, that can help with that. Good, perfect. So in terms of restoring rotational alignment, uh, on the femur side, you only have the transepicondylar axis to, re to reference. So you'll see me draw sort of a bovie line there. You also want to just uh, akin to gap balancing. You want to make sure that uh, your your component is and your gap is rectangular. And since we've already made that uh, intramedullary reference tibial cut at zero degrees, then we can reference uh, the the tibial cut as well. All right, Will Rubenstein, are you on the line? Uh, yes, he had to take his daughter to a doctor's appointment. Eric Arati. She's at Shriners in Sacramento. Aaron Kim. Uh, out of town on vacation. Monica Coglin. She's uh, also out today. We're all the way to you, Sacha. Yeah, I know. Lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So which of the following factors minimizes patellar maltracking and tony arthroplasty? So um, the choices are increased posterior tibial slope, medialization of the patellar component, internal rotation of the femoral component, internal rotation of the tibial component, and jo joint line um, elevation. So um, looking at this, so number one, uh, increased posterior tibial slope um, really shouldn't have a major impact on uh, patellar maltracking. Um, well, what, what does it affect? I think uh, how I just mentioned this. Yeah, it affects your, your flexion gap. So if you have a greater posterior tibial slope, you will have, um, it'll help, it'll make a more loose sort of flexion gap. Good. Um, medializing the patellar component um, would help uh, with patellar maltracking. Um, yes. And so if you look here at what a patella looks like, it's a very funny shaped bone but the articular surface is medialized, right? So you want to kind of kind of recreate that. And that's why we medialize our button. Right. Yeah, you medialize the button, exactly. Um, and then, uh, so internal rotation of the femoral component would make tracking uh, worse, um, as would internal rotation of the tibial component. And then joint line elevation is going to change your ability to flex. Um, yeah. So if it's too high, then you're, you're going to have difficulty with obtaining full flexion. So if you uh, if you raise your joint line, you get patella baja, right? And patella baja can affect 
patellar mount tracking. So that's, that's not a good thing to do. Um, so good, perfect. So in terms of bone loss management, you want to provide a stable platform for reconstruction and you can get into really bad bone loss situations. Uh, and historically, we've always talked about restoring bone stock for future revisions. You see it a lot in hips where we put allograft in there. We don't really do it too much for knees because we, we've relied a lot more on our metal uh, implants. Um, but you want to restore uh, a relatively anatomic joint line. This will optimize the ligament stability uh, and minimizes the need for more constrained components. So these are our, our workhorses for how we deal with uh, a bone loss. Um, so we have sleeves and cones. And the goal of these are to provide some biologic metaphyseal fixation. Uh, just like uh, around our hips, you get osteointegration into these implants. Uh, and that provides for a durable fixation compared to cement, which has uh, a known um, sort of a course of loosening over time. So the indications for this are not only filling deficient metaphyseal bone, uh, if it uh, has occurred from the loosening process, but some people are actually using it um, in, in sort of uh, um, primary settings of say, putting a hinge in. And the idea is not that you have metaphyseal bone loss, but you're trying to improve the survivorship of the cement interface because uh, when you have um, sort of uh, a lot of stresses, you want to have a lot of uh, resisting forces, and this provides uh, that. So these are sleeves, and sleeves are proprietary to Depew. They're used with cementless stems, and the sleeve is actually mated to the stem via the Morse taper. So they are linked together. Your sleeve and your stem are, are combined. Uh, and then you only use a little bit of cement right at the surface uh, of the joint, whether it's the tibia or the femur. And you can see sort of the bone preparation for the sleeve, which is done uh, via brooches. The cones are for all other implant manufacturers. And the, the, they have multiple geometries. This is an example of a tibial symmetric cone. These are some asymmetric tibial cones. This is a femoral cone. Uh, and they are used independently of the stem. So you can put your cone wherever you want it, and then you can put your stem wherever you want it. And so it's used with cemented stems. So that's kind of the difference between sleeves and cones, but they're used in various uh, similar situations. It's a surgeon preference. In terms of level of constraint, we talked about trying to use the least amount of constraint that is necessary. So you can go all the way from a mobile bearing, sort of minimally constrained knee, you've got cruciate retaining total knee. Again, for junior residents, you see the peg, no box. Posterior stabilized knee, you see the box. This is uh, the next level of constraint, which is varus valgus constraint. And you will often see a metallic reinforcing peg uh, that is um, supporting that thicker, uh, higher post. And then the final level of constraint is a rotating hinge. So kind of like the constrained liner of the hip, this is the rotating hinge. And the reason it's rotating is that the knee is not a simple hinge mechanism. There's a screw home mechanism through flexion and extension. And so that the, the implant has to, to accommodate that or it'll put more stresses on the uh, implant uh, cement and cement bone interface. Um, so moving on to the fives, Eric McDonald, this one, treatment of a CR total knee that's unstable in flexion is best accomplished by um, so, unstable flexion. You, I mean, you could uh, check and see if the um, if it's the cruise ship, but you could revise to a posterior stabilized. Um, mm -hmm. Revising to a thinner poly is not going to help you. Um, a larger femoral component would potentially um, tighten up your flexion gap. Um, I wouldn't want to limit their flexion. And then um, using quadriceps conditioning and a derotation brace, I don't think that that would help. So my, my vote would be for number one. Yeah, I think one in three are on the table, um, but uh, you, you don't necessarily want to go to a bigger femoral component if that's, that's not the issue, because you could get oversized on the femur and cause soft tissue impingement. But I think what this question stem is alluding to is that the patient has had late attrition of their PCL and uh, by, by switching to a PS knee, that would be the, the best fix for it.
Um, and then we talk about intramedullary stems. You can use cemented or cementless stems. The cementless stems are, are not on growth stems like uh, our femoral stems uh, in a hip replacement. Uh, they just have these splines that give it a little bit of rotational stability. Uh, what they do do is they offload stress from the damaged bone to the intact diaphysis. They provide increased surface area for fixation uh, in the cemented uh, group. Uh, and they can also help ensure restoration of alignment since you are basically referencing the IM canals if there's not a lot of deformity there. So these were my um, keys to success of a revision total knee. So don't go in there if you don't know what you're trying to fix. Definitely rule out infection, obtain adequate exposure, um, including potentially extensile ones. You want to minimize the amount of bone loss incurred during removing the old components with meticulous technique. You want to reestablish the symmetry of your gaps and your joint line uh, to ensure uh, proper kinematics. Uh, you want to restore proper coronal sagittal uh, and transverse alignment to the components for patellar tracking as well. You want to minimize the amount of constraint necessary and utilize uh, adjuncts uh, like augments, cones, and stems uh, for uh, maximizing the stability. So now we're going to go to any questions before I move to name that construct. <clears throat> I just have a quick question, Dr. Hansen. Um, yeah. You know, getting back to like implant removal and minimizing iatrogenic bone loss. Um, you know, there I feel like there's more use of cementless total knees, or it's becoming a little bit more popular. Are there any like special tricks for that when you're trying to take out a cementless total knee, or just you know, same thing? Just be really careful that you're right there in your implant bone interface. Yeah, we just did one. Uh... Uh, this week. Um, so it's same, same exact technique, just be very meticulous. Uh, obviously, there's no second interface that you can try to uh, insinuate your implants, uh, your instruments through. Um, but same, same, same technique, but be prepared for some degree of bone loss and, and needing to, to uh, augment that uh, uh, or to use some type of metaphyseal uh, fixation when you are reconstructing. But the bone can be quite stress shielded and mushy behind a cement yeah. implant. Okay. So I'm going to move to Alex Gornitsky. You on the line? Laura Moore. All studying for OID. Satariano, I mean boards. Bagoni. Everyone's off. Go, Paul. Go, Paul's in Hawaii. We got a we got a flush. Oh, Eric McDonald's representing. All right, moving back down to the twos. Hunter, you're still on. So we're gonna call it's called name that construct. So you can tell me primary versus revision. What type of fixation? Cemented versus cementless. Level of constraint. Stem type and additional details and hardware. So this is the first one. What kind of knee is this? Don't tell me about size, position, and fixation. Just what type of knee? So this looks like a revision uh, posterior stabilized um, knee with, uh, it looks like a cone as well as, um, you know, a CCK. So it has additional constraint uh, and then a femoral stem. Yeah, so initially you said a posterior stabilized total knee. So this is a semi-constrained total knee. So in terms of primary versus revision, this is a revision. This is a semi-constrained implant. And you can tell that by this metal reinforcing bar in the polyethylene. And then in terms of stems, this is a cemented total knee. I mean, cemented stems. And it's got a additional tibial cone. Good. Dr. Hanson, the, uh, the interns just messaged that they're a little bummed that they're not being uh, called on either. So I know you haven't worked with them yet, but oh my I think God. some of the interns want to I wish I had the list. How are you going to do them like that, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dr. Hanson, I'm here. I was just, I was in the bathroom. I'm here. I'm here. Your Pagoni is back? All right. So yeah, tell me what type of implant bathroom. this is. Don't tell me about oh, side position gonna... and fixation. Uh, actually, I'm on vacation. Sorry. Uh, so this is a uh, cement, well, we don't, it's a cement list, but um, it uh, looks like it has a box, so. Uh, PS. 
So I would say this is a cementless CR total knee. This, these, this, this is the peg, right? I think you're seeing some obliquity. Maybe you think that that's a box. This is a yeah. striker cementless total knee. And you can, uh, again, this is not commonly seen, um, at least in our training. So it's good to see what a cementless knee is. One of the tip offs is that the patella is metal backed and you don't see a lot of metal backed patellas. Uh, but you don't see the cement uh, uh, cloud, the interdigitation uh, around yeah, it. It's got the, additional the spikes. spikes on the um, the tibial. So good. All right. Um, I think we're going back. Uh, did I call on Hunter again? Hunter is back on the line. Or did I just call you? Yeah, I just called you. Sorry, Fabian, Sue. Hey, Dr. Hansen. Uh, so this is a uh, semi-constrained revision total knee. Looks like there's a prior TTO, there was a TTO that was done for exposure. Uh, the stems are, uh, they look like they are cementless. Good. So this is a semi-constrained revision total knee with diaphyseal engaging or cementless stems. You can see by the girth of the stems that they're engaging the endosteum. They're not as tight as you might with a, uh, you know, a hip stem, but they're definitely not the cemented. There is some cement around the metaphysis where there are some bony deficiencies. And you're correct that those three screws uh, indicate a prior tibial tubercle osteotomy. All right, Sarah, you're on. Okay, so this is, this to me looks like a press fit. So an uncemented revision, total knee. Uh, there appears to be a tibial sleeve. There is uh, semi, there's coronal plane semi constraint. And then um, I think there could also be a sleeve on the femoral side, just looking at the sort of step nature of that stem. Yeah, so this is a cent cementless, semi-constrained revision knee. And, and what you are seeing is that sleeve construct on both the tibia and the femur. Is it fair to say on the last one that uh, the, I mean, if you look at the um, AP and the lateral, the stem and the femur doesn't seem to be engaging cortex. I mean, obviously it's a circular bone, so it's we're not seeing every little bit, but is that, do you usually see more cortical um, contact? Yeah, so, I mean, again, when you have your sleeve, your sleeve is your construct. Your sleeve is your, is your stability. And the stem is kind of, you know, whatever you call it, suspenders over belt type of thing. Um, and so it's not as important well, because the fixation and your, your foundation is built off your sleeve. Okay. All right, Jen O'Donnell, you still on the line? Yep. All right. Um, so here we have a, um, looks like there's some cement in the tibia. So it's cemented um, hinge revision knee um, with um, a TTO hardware and cerclage wires are there. Um, and there's also a sleeve on the femoral component. Yeah, so this is kind of a hybrid fixation. This is, and you're right, this is a hinge total knee replacement. So for those who haven't seen it, you'll see something that bridges the gap between the femur and the tibia. It's sort of an axle spindle system. Uh, so this is a hinge component, the highest level of constraint. The tibia is uh, cemented, the stem is cemented but the femur is that sleeve construct. So that's why I'm just calling it a hybrid kind of technique. Uh, but as I mentioned, we do use some cement to fill in the nooks and crannies just so that there's not gaps. Um, but uh, that's primarily, that's a cementless uh, uh, femoral component. All right, uh, Matt Churches. Yep, I'm here. Uh, this looks like a revision that is uh, looks cementless. Um, looks like it's a PS. I don't see any uh, reinforcing ring uh, in the poly. Good. So this is a revision cementless total knee. 
um, because the cement is just around the metaphysis. These are cementless stems. It, uh, this system, uh, if you knew, uh, has the option to go to semi-constrained without that bar in it. It's a, a Smith and Nephew, but good. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, and you can actually see some augments here too. You see the augments under the tibial base plate. That's another thing to kind of highlight. And even behind the femur too. Dr. Hanson, going back to that one, uh, on the lateral and the distal aspect of those uh, axial stems for the, the tibia, it looks like there's a lot, it doesn't look like it's a tight fit or tightly engaged. Um, I guess with that, with that amount of space around the stem, were you, or is that, uh, would, would you be concerned about loosening that, that stem swimming around in that space? Well, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, I didn't ask you about size, position, and fixation, but this tibia has moved. Um, and so this is a loose tibial component. You can see a circumferential radial lucency around it. You can see a pedestal on the bottom. It's probably subsided to a degree. So yes, that, uh, um, that is uh, not ideal. And, uh, and the other tip off that this is an uncemented stem is you see those closed pins, both on the tibia and the femur. All right, uh, Aviana's not here, Tiffany's not here, Hobby's not here, Steven's not here, Ryan's still here? Ryan's still here. Um, so this looks like a uh, primary, so it's a primary total knee. It looks to be cement-less. Um, I would call it a posterior stabilized given the box there. Yeah, so it's definitely a posterior stabilized primary total knee. But again, if you see the patella cemented, you see this yeah. radial opacity, that's cement. Maybe not the best cement uh, job, but cement nonetheless. And, and unfortunately, this tibia is loose as well with this radial lucency around the keel. Yeah. Good. All right. Mark is still on the line? Yeah, I'm here. What's this construct? Um, provision total knee, uh, this is a hinge construct. I see a sleeve on the tibia, um, and the stem is cementless. There's probably a little bit of cement underneath the base plate there. And then the femur is a distal femoral replacement. Um, and then I see a cerclage wire around the, the diaphysis. Uh, so maybe there was an intra-op fracture there. Um, and that stem is cemented. Yeah, so yeah. this is a uh, distal femoral replacement. So different from our regular hinges that we saw before, this is to replace the whole distal femur. The femur is, the femoral stem is cemented. This is probably a prophylactic cerclage cable, but may, that may have occurred, uh, is an iatrogenic uh, split uh, and correct sleeve on the tibia and a metal back patella. And then, uh, Leah, still on the line? Yep, I'm here. Um, this looks like a revision total knee. Um, this is both the femoral and the tibial components are cementless. Um, and they both have uh, long diaphyseal stems. There is a sleeve on the tibial in the tibial metaphysis, and it's a semi constrained construct. Good. So it, this is a cone. So remember the sleeves are proprietary to Depew and yeah. that's the one where the sleeve and the stem are connected. But you're right. It's got a metaphyseal fixation. This is a cone. Oh, good. Um, and, and so we've probably beaten this horse to death. This is another example of a, a cementless primary total knee. Um, different construct, but you see those um, sort of trabecular metal um, uh, pegs in the tibial uh, component. Um, and that, so where are they now? So the final, so we'll just rehash those, those cases. So this was that patient, uh, ended up with a semi-constrained total knee with some distal and posterior femoral augments, uh, and cementless stems. Um, so that was for the aseptic loosening one. This is the one that had the, uh, uncorrected valgus. So again, those were the alignment films then had to, uh, be, uh, converted to this semi-constrained total knee with some distal augments and some offset stems. And then you can see the mechanical axis falling much better through the central third of the tibial plateau. This was the patient with the 
uh, infection. So this is back in the day. I put static spacers. I probably would have done a, a articulating spacer these days. Uh, this was the patient with the flexion instability and the patellar maltracking. Uh, so ended up again with uh, semi-constrained uh, total knee with cementless stems, a VMO advancement, and a lateral release. And then this was the patient uh, with the uh, hip arthritis, so ended up with a primary total hip. Any questions? Dr. Hansen, for the patient with the valgus alignment, what degree of deformity would you consider to do like an osteotomy above, like to fix the deformity before changing it? Um, so she, uh, she, she had a lot of, uh, I would say, tibia valga, and she had some val valgus, uh, uh, significant valgus alignment. This was actually my first case at Parnassus, unfortunately, and that turned into this complication. Uh, I did bilateral total knees um, and did the right one fine. And uh, I didn't get scanograms when I first started. I probably would have learned something um, from, from that scanogram to help me intraoperatively. Um, but she does she did not have like a femoral malunion or a tibial malunion. The way, you know, we posed this question to Bob Namba when he was uh, our visiting professor at Imminent Abbott. So the way I think about uh, correcting um, the deformity is that you have to look and draw your lines of your tibia to see where your cut, your proximal tibia cut is and where your distal femur cut is. And if that cut is going to violate the collateral ligaments, then, then you have to do something extra articular. If you can um, make the correction through the knee without violating the epicondyles or um, um, the uh, tibial tubercle or the MCL insertion, then you can correct it through the knee. Dr. Hansen, do you mind going back to the x-ray for the valgus patient? I, uh, you're talking about a tibial offset uh, component. I was just curious to learn more about that. So, so you see how she has this bow in her tibia? That probably accounted for a certain amount of valgus. That's why on the short film, we, we talked about uh, the, the short plate looked like the right knee was in varus. It actually was perpendicular to her uh, mechanical axis. Um, so for this, this is an offset stem. So in order to get the base plate to fit and have a stem, you can't, if, if I had put a straight stem on that base plate, I would have been overhanging medially. So it needs to, you need to kind of decouple where the plateau uh, plate is and where the stem engages the, the, the tibia uh, uh, IM canal. Gotcha, thank you for explaining that. And you can do it 360 degrees, whether you have to go A to P or medial to lateral. Dr. Hansen, are there only certain revision systems that have that capability? You know, like Smith and Nephew does. All, all systems have offsets, offset couplers for their stems. No further questions? All right, well, thank you for entertaining me and, and, and participating.